Hello, and welcome to the Second Drafts podcast, everything you need to write, edit, and publish your way. I'm Jeremy. And I'm EJ. And today we'll be discussing financial reports. Oh, Yay. that sounds a bit dry. <laughs> 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 we'll we'll try and uh, we'll try and keep it light here. So uh, basically, uh, if you guys haven't heard of it, there there's this site called AuthorEarnings.com, and uh, they've been doing a lot of uh, reports uh, over the past a long while. Uh, basically, just about uh, financial situation regarding eBooks, and uh, it's mainly I think focused on indie authors. Uh, compared mm. to traditional publishers, but they definitely do uh, comparisons to kind of see uh, the relationship between uh, Indies' rise versus, say, the uh, big five publishers or other publishers' decline, mm. kind of seeing how uh, how that's going and and whether or not there really is uh, that uh, that switch going on. Mm. And. Okay. The most recent report there is from February, and uh, some things caught my eye on it, so I thought uh, we could kind of discuss a little bit of it. Yeah, sure. Sounds good. <laughs> so uh, the first thing that I saw uh, was with regards to uh, author earnings, the site there, uh, and Amazon, uh, both saying that there's an increase in book sales, yet... You know, everywhere else that you see online uh, says that there's a decline. Mm. And this sure is specifically for, well. yeah, this is specifically for ebooks now, right? Uh, well, I haven't. I, I thought I saw both. Like I thought I saw uh, places saying that there was a decline in both. Oh uh, yeah. But okay. Amazon and author earnings uh, saying that there's a rise in both. Yeah. So. Uh, we both read the report, of course, <laughs> but uh, I'd like to get your thoughts there, Ethan. Uh, maybe you've seen something along those lines, like seeing reports of decline in ebook sales, and uh, get your thoughts on maybe what you thought the reason was uh, before reading the report. Uh, yeah, um, I've uh, I've read some today in the report, and I mean. Uh, Going back a little while, I mean, I've been reading a bit of uh, Joe Conrad's blog and a bit of the, what was this, the Authors Guild and all of that, you know, that stuff with the Amazon and the publishers and stuff. And um, the sense that I'm getting from it all, I mean, this will probably only be news to people who haven't, you, you know, been reading anything about this, is uh, there's a bit of a war going on between the, the publishers and the and the indies, of course. I don't know whether people would characterize it like that, but, you know, <laughs> everywhere I, I read about, it seems the publishers are very keen on either suppressing ebook sales or, you know, under-reporting it, or at the very least, you know, kind of favoring their print books over the ebooks. So I think... In general, it is in their best interest. Somehow, in the in the warped logic, I think I've gotten the sense that uh, the publishers <laughs> see it as a victory when ebook sales go down, or at least when ebooks ebook sales growth slows down. Yeah, and I'm not quite sure what their logic is behind all that. <laughs> That's the well, sense I get. Yeah, I, I kind of have to agree. I sometimes like it when we don't agree so that we can kind of get a little <laughs> more of a discussion going there. But yeah, I, I kind of had the same thought there because uh, I've definitely seen in the past where people have reported that ebook sales are lower and thus uh, they kind of try and reason that uh, it's because there's so many indies out there and and nobody's really rising to the top as it were and uh, mm. people are just kind of getting lost in the in the sea of all those indie books and that's kind of one of the things i remember reading a long time ago that there's just so many now that it's uh nobody's really uh buying very many because they you know say have a bad experience or something like that that's that's mm. one of the things that i've heard before but uh, it's definitely not true, and um, the author earnings report there uh, supports that. And one of the things that I found was really interesting 
which might kind of account for uh, the numbers backing up these other people who are saying there is a decline is that a lot of it has to do probably with how uh, these books, these indie books, don't always have ISBNs. And mm -hmm. those traditional uh, reporting things, uh, reporting places, aren't able to report on those ones because they don't have those ISBNs. They're not able to actually see the sales. Mm -hmm. And uh, a couple of things from the report here says uh, only 29% of the ebook purchases each day on Amazon.com get officially counted in the monthly uh, stat shot reports from the Association of American Publishers. And it goes on to say 43% of the ebooks purchased each day on Amazon, nearly half of them, remain uncounted in any, any traditional industry t statistics, such as those published by Boker, Nielsen, uh, because 43% of the ebooks purchased each day on Amazon do not have associated ISBNs. Hmm. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a huge chunk. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I wonder whether th whether this bugs them that their stats don't cover this. I mean, do they go and say, well, you know, these books that don't have ISBNs, they're not real books anyway. Is that? Do you think that's really <laughs> their opinion on the matter? Yeah, I'm not too sure. Like, I don't, I don't know if uh, they'd even really be able to rectify that because I'm sure that Amazon would be very protective over their sales numbers and and stuff like that. So even if they wanted to try and get that information, I don't think Amazon would even even give that out. Yeah, but then you have to ask the question, knowing you know, if someone were to tell them, "Look, you're missing all this data," you kind of have to wonder what. What is what are their stats telling us? Well, you know, can we even trust those stats? Because, you know, even if it's the best that these people can do with the limited ISBN info that they've got, it's really not giving a full picture of anything. Mm -hmm. We're getting just this. <laughs> yeah, just like half of the information, pretty much mm -hmm. literally. <laughs> and uh, I mean, like, you can't fault all these blogs for saying that. You know, ebook sales are down because technically they kind of are down if you look at yeah. only half of the data. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, and, that's, that should be stats 101. But, uh... <laughs> yeah. And one of the other things there uh, that I mentioned, I don't think it really had any specific data on there, but uh, the Kindle Unlimited uh, pages read. Mm. I also don't believe that that is being reported either because, again, I think that's uh, specifically tied to Amazon, yeah. and they probably don't really want to share that data with anyone. Like yeah. they might give an overall, like, oh, this is how many pages have been read, or something like that. But they they wouldn't say uh, the real details of that, probably. Yeah, yeah. Amazon is notoriously tight-lipped about their data, yeah. which I mean is fair enough. I can't blame them, yeah. but uh, yeah. So. The thing about these ISBNs, just a quick note, I mean, in case people are wondering, oh, what's the thing with that, with the ISBNs? Why do some books not have them? Why? The thing is, traditional books, print books need ISBNs. That's what they tell you. And in the main, it's true, especially if you want to be distributed to libraries and bookshops and stuff. You, you typically need an ISBN so they can scan your book and, you know, have a record. But, uh, in this new digital marketplace that, that Amazon's created with the Kindle, uh, it turned out you really don't need an ISBN if you're only going to be selling your book uh, digitally. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you could get one. Um, I remember for my book, I think I got four different ones, you know, one for the Kindle version, one for the EPUB, one for the... Uh, it's a lot of schlep. It's a lot of work. <laughs> and yeah. in the end, it turned out, you know, if you're just going to be selling on Amazon, you don't even need an ISBN. Uh, CreateSpace could even assign an ISBN for your print book. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Amazon itself works only on that ASIN number, yeah. which they assign, assign themselves as well. So I think that's why so many books on Amazon just end up without any sort of ISBN that these traditional uh, associations can track. Well, and plus, uh, a lot of places like uh, Canada were kind of fortunate because uh, we can get ISBNs for free. But I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure that a lot of places like the U.S., 
you do have to pay to yeah. get an ISBN. So yeah. last I checked, it was hundred twenty-five dollars for one ISBN. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and that's I can understand why some people would not want to make that investment because yeah. you know you already got editing, you already got the cover, mm. that sort of thing. So yeah. having on top of that an ISBN that costs one hundred twenty-five dollars, <laughs> no wonder there's yeah. like half of them that don't have it. Yeah. So. And just just before someone goes and says about these stats, you know. But books that don't have ISBNs don't need to be counted because they're not valid books. See, that's where I think we will strongly differ because, I mean, tell that to the people who do 57% of the sales on Amazon. That's millions of dollars that people are living off of. They're paying bills. They're buying cars, buying houses off of that money, indie authors. So, I mean, you try telling them that that's not a real book. That's not a real thing. They're making a living off of this. So having an ISBN does not prevent you at all from selling your books. Yeah, <laughs> which is I mean, awesome. you know, not not to you know toot our own horns there, but like uh, a lot of indie authors, they take a lot of time and care into putting out their books. So to say that they're not relevant uh, is definitely an mm. undersight. And I'm sure that anyone who's listening to this really is uh, on our side with that. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, yeah, <laughs> preaching to the choir. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the uh, next big one there. Um, I guess uh, maybe we should talk about how they kind of updated their reporting statistics first. Why don't you uh, mm. handle that there, Ethan? Yeah, in the, the report that came out in February of this year, they they made a special note of it that they've, they've updated their data model, uh, these author earnings guys. So they've, they've completely reworked it from the ground up. Um, their previous model used to be crowdsourced, so they used a lot of information from indie authors themselves that say, you know, uh, you know, this month I had so many hundred sales maybe and my ranking was that. And then they kind of aggregated all their data to kind of try and work out from what a book's ranking is how many sales it probably had for that month. Mm-hmm. So that's how they used to do it. And now from this author earnings at the beginning of this year, they actually changed their uh, data model. So, look, I'm, I'm no expert on stats and data, so I'm not going to pretend even. But uh, they... Well, I think it was that they took a, they just took a bigger sample size of people. They were able to get the sales versus sales rank. I wonder what it? Yeah. yeah, I think it was just a bigger sample size so that it was more accurate. Like even uh, they said there uh, in one part uh, that their old way was actually fairly accurate, but uh, mm. they were able to get it just even uh, better because of how many how many uh, numbers that they were able to get mm. from a lot of people. So basically, over time, probably a lot of people uh, seeing their reports joined up and were able to give them a lot more information. Mm. Yeah, I see here they ended up with like a million data points and... It's yeah. just, it's a lot bigger and it's it's become a lot more accurate now, according yeah, to anyone, them. <laughs> no, if anyone knows statistics, the more numbers that you take, the less margin of error there's going to be. Yeah. So. <laughs> so, yeah, to people who are interested in this, by all means, I mean, we we have the link there. You can go take a look at the author yeah. earnings report if you haven't seen it yet. It's uh, very impressive. I look at it and I just see nice colors and I'm like, oh, that's pretty. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> But yeah, one of the other uh, things I found interesting was that uh, after they got that uh, sales to sales rank model kind of down, mm. they took almost uh, 200,000 books in those bestseller ranks. They got all of the information, the sales rank and and uh, all that stuff. And they took that information and disassembled it and kind of looked at uh how much the gross sales would be, say, in dollars and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the interesting things that kind of came out of that uh, was uh, basically says the big five publishers, so those are the biggest book mm-hmm. publishers, like uh, Penguin, Random House, and... Yeah, Sun uh, and Schuster. Yeah, those other ones. Yeah. Uh, they account for the majority of gross sales in dollars, with 40% of Amazon ebook sales dollars going to them and 23% uh, 
uh, going to indie publishers. Uh, but as far as what actually goes to the author, indie publishing beats them out of the water with 44% of the total revenue going to authors versus 23%. <laughs> it's almost the opposite yeah. there. Yeah, that is. It just and goes to show how much, you know, how much of that author earnings the, the publishers kind of drain away for all the services that they provide. Yeah, exactly. Ooh. And the Big Five's ebook sales in dollars and units are actually going down, whereas mm. indies are increasing. Yeah. And now look, this is, this is no mystery, I think, why their ebook yeah. sales are going down. I think that's what they've wanted all along. <laughs> yeah. they've, they've been extremely uh, antagonistic with Amazon on this whole agency pricing thing. They've kind of almost forced Amazon to keep those ebook prices super high and kind of preventing Amazon from discounting those ebooks. Yeah, that was one of the interesting things as well. I didn't know about that was that Amazon was actually discounting their mm. ebooks at Amazon's own expense <laughs> so that they would get more sales and uh, they were probably still paying. Uh, the big five the same amount as what they would normally get so mm. basically just breaking even every time that they sold an ebook but uh, they negotiated those new contracts and now those big five publishers can do whatever they want with the prices and then yeah. uh, that's why there's going to be that decline but mm. uh, with indie publishers uh, Basically, we can price them at really anything we want, $0.99 cents to $99. Uh, and one of the things that it found was that uh, 20 of the overall top 100 uh, best-selling ebooks were indie titles, and they were priced between $2.99 and $5.99. Mm -hmm. uh, you'd think they might be you know, $0.99, cents, but that's not the case. So people are willing to buy in that range. Uh, a lot more often it seems and yeah. uh, probably the higher quality ones uh, you know you, you would think that they would be there as well um, I remember a lot of the uh, thought way back when was that 299 was kind of the standard for the indie ebook yeah but then uh, as you know you kind of go along uh, you start to hear more about people who are kind of rising those prices up a little bit and uh, I actually have a little bit of experience that myself um, when I was looking over my average sales, I noticed that when I released my second book, my sales actually went up by 80%. Whew. That's a and, huge jump. Yeah. And it even stayed there after I increased the price to four ninety nine. So it was at two ninety nine for each of them before. But even after I raised it to four ninety nine, it uh, it stayed the same. Because mm. I think by then you've you your book had already climbed the rankings, and it was kind of a bit more visible on the on the lists, maybe. Yeah, I think I had a, a few more reviews at that point. There, I have uh, mm. I have forty five right now. I think I had maybe a little less than twenty at that point. So okay. still not too bad. But uh, even after that, though. Uh, when I put the first book on for free permanently, uh, my sales increased even further, another 80%. And That's so, awesome. like, basically, the four ninety nine price is really working well for that second book. And uh, basically, the thing that I think we can take away from this and plus the top 20 of the 100 best selling ebooks is that. And don't be afraid to experiment with your pricing mm. and especially if you have like a, a longer book i say putting it on 99 cents is probably not the best idea you're not going to get as much and it it definitely won't be as good of a value yeah but, yeah i mean we could do an entire episode on that where yeah. you know you you think that the lower price will always give the person the better sense of value you know oh wow look i got this for 99 cents but I mean, I've noticed myself when I paid only 99 cents for a book, often I don't even read it. <laughs> but, you know, if I bought one of uh, Brent Weeks's books through, I think it's Hachette, one of the big five, and I paid $9.99 for it, then you can be sure I'm going to be reading it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I kind of find myself uh, doing that when it comes to uh, video games sometimes. When you pay mm. uh, 60 to $80 for a video game and you know <laughs> you see all those reviews saying how bad it is or something like that and you're like, oh, I had fun with it. Yeah. <laughs> what are you guys talking about? I made a good investment. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> as soon as you pay for something, it's like almost like you want to convince yourself that it's maybe better than it actually is. Because why would I have spent all that money if it wasn't good? You know, <laughs> it's a little strange how that works. <laughs> but but just one other thing is uh, that I think people can take away from here is that f- I think f- it's it's good to see that for indies to compete in the top twenty for sales you don't need to bottom out your prices in order to play up there in the high portions of the list. Mm -hmm. I think it's good to see that even with proper prices, as long as your work is, you know, of high quality, you can still compete. Um, And, I mean, you don't have to scrape the bottom of the barrel price-wise in order to do that. Yeah, and uh, it's, of course, not to say, like, uh, that you can't put it on for 99 cents or like mm. what I did, put it on, put uh, one on for free. Um, and then that could help, especially if you're in a series. But it's all about experimenting. And uh, mm. one of the things I saw recently, I, I'm part of this group on a, a site called LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. Um, not sure if you're familiar with it. There. Oh, yeah, I know that. The professional social network. <laughs> yeah. I don't really use it very much, but... Uh, I don't think anybody does, let's be honest. (laughs) (laughs) No offense, LinkedIn. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, no offense. Please don't block my profile or something. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, I do uh, get an email regularly about uh, this group of authors that I'm a part of on there. And somebody recently posted something uh, from their personal blog about how they feel that putting ebooks on for free devalues them. And Mm. I've often seen that quite a bit where people will say that, you know, putting on for 99 cents devalues the book, putting on for free devalues the book, that sort of thing. But I had to just post back on like my sales numbers and how I really disagreed with that because uh, there's definitely going to be instances where you will want to put the book on for free. And uh, definitely, I, I especially find with a series, putting the first one on for free, uh, even say offering one to uh, to get email subscribers or something like that, offering mm-hmm. something for free, you know, you're going to get people, uh, more people are going to get in there and actually read it and uh, potentially buy the next one, which is at least in my case true. Uh, of course, it's not not always going to be true, but uh, saying, flat out saying no is never a good idea, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely. It's, yeah, look, this, this way of people saying, oh, this is going to devalue it, it's, it's exactly the way that the big five publishers are thinking at this moment. That's why they're trying to keep ebook prices artificially high, I think. They're refusing to let the market decide how much they want to pay for, for ebooks, um, because I think they'd rather sell paper books than ebooks to begin with. So they're kind of pricing their ebooks out of the market, kind of. So I think in, uh, that's, a very dangerous way to think of stuff because, you know, going against what the customer wants, you know, going against what the market wants is, you know, traditional wisdom says, oh, that's kind of a very bad idea. The market is supposed to decide how it values your books, what people are going to pay. And the nice thing about being an indie publisher is that you have that control. Like you said, experimentation is key. Being yeah. an indie publisher, you know, being your own publisher kind of allows you to, to go, you know, roll with the punches, go with the flow. Just put it for 99 cents if you need to do that and see what happens and push it up more once you've, you know, climbed the ranks. So a lot of leeway you get being a, a self-publisher. Um, yeah, it's almost kind of sad when you put it like that in a way for those people who are, who are stuck sometimes. Yeah, yeah who've already... Publishers. And once you're with them, the problem sometimes becomes like they get first option on all your new stuff. So I, I sometimes I just imagine being in that situation where, you know, you kind of you're in a situation where the publisher is artificially suppressing your ebook sales mm-hmm. um, by keeping the prices high. You can do nothing about it. You can write a new book to try and write a new series, but the publisher will get first dibs on it. So if, if you write anything new, you're kind of obligated to show it to your publisher first. 
Now you have mm-hmm. to choose. Do you make it fantastic because you want to begin self-publishing fantastic books? Well, the publisher is going to see it's fantastic and they're going to nab it. They're going to take it and they're going to do the same thing to your new IP. <laughs> yeah. Or do you write a mediocre thing that you hope the publisher won't be interested in and but then you you're trying to start a self-publishing career with something that's you know mediocre that's mm. not really going to work so it's it's it is kind of sad thinking of uh, how some of these market forces have these perverse incentives built into them for the publishers that just, just make sure to read those contracts and that fine print before yeah. you actually <laughs> sign on the dotted line yeah that's evergreen advice <laughs> yeah. and uh, kind of tying in with the print side of things there the last thing that uh, I found was interesting was that uh, kind of tying into what you were saying before there mm-hmm. uh, print sales for those big five publishing houses uh, makes up only 22% of the top seller lists but they make up 47% of the gross dollar dollars made in print sales and uh, 47% of the gross goes to the big five authors, whereas uh, only 14% of the gross goes to indie authors. Mm-hmm. So those big five uh, guys are, uh, they're probably not in the, not a lot of them are in the top sellers for the print books, but they are making more off of those and yeah. authors are making more from those than indie side of things. Yeah. Just to, to kind of elucidate, you know, what that means, it is kind of just coming down to the fact that the big five books are not selling the best, but they are making the most money. And what that tells you is that they are per unit, they're selling fewer units, but making more money. So they are a lot more expensive per unit. Um, so, you know, if you want to put this uncharitably, you could say, Big five books are not selling that well, but those that they do sell, they're gouging the customers to make sure they make a lot of money off of every book. That's yeah. that's kind of to say it in a kind of a mean way, which um, <laughs> but it seems to be true. Yeah, that's that's what the stats seem to be saying. And uh, on our end of things, with the indie side of things, I I think it it almost ties in with uh, that pricing. Side of things like if you're with Create Space or something like that, mm-hmm. you're more likely going to probably put the price a little bit lower than what you possibly could put it at for a print mm-hmm. print book. Uh, I know myself. I think I'm making probably about the same amount as uh, I am for the ebook as I am for the print side of things. But I probably mm-hmm. could even put it a little bit higher just because of the length of the book itself. Yeah. And probably make a little bit more off of it, but uh, as the data shows as well, I think uh, probably a lot of indie authors are feeling the same way. <laughs> mm, <laughs> They're just yeah. putting it, kind of lowballing it, as it were. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think there's a, there's a lot more pressure for indie authors to try to compete, and um, I mean you can compete in quality and you can do your best, but in the end, competing in price is another option. In case you feel that, you know, I don't know, am I competing in quality? Am I not? Mm. So, as one final thing, now that we're talking about print, I wanted to mention that uh, one thing that I think is is, is starting to become clear slowly, um, and it's something that I, I never wanted to, to admit to before, you know, when I brought out my first novel, I went all the way, you know, everything an indie can do. I did the Kindle version, I did the CreateSpace version, I bought a new font for the interior i did all sorts of crazy things got a good cover well a lot of that is a lot of uh, you know good advice to do really guys <laughs> we can't stress this enough go get a good cover but other than that i think in the meantime what you can see from these stats is that in the indie space at least um print sales are not making up a very big portion of what indies are selling. Indies are selling a lot of digital books. They're mm-hmm. actually outselling the traditional publishers on ebooks, which is awesome. When it comes to print, it's something like four percent. It's the the size of the you know the pie slice that go to indies. Mm-hmm. So it's not a lot. 
So there comes a point where you have to ask yourself, look, if, if you're going to be limited in time and effort that you can spend on this, is it worth it to bring out a print version of your book? I mean, it's a, it's a very nice feeling. It's, a, it's, it's, it's awesome to have that final book, you know, printed and in your hands, say, through something like CreateSpace or Lightning Source. But in the end, compared to how many sales there are going to be, is your time better spent creating that? You know, it's it's quite tough to create that um, that print interior. I remember it was it was like eighty percent of my headache was <laughs> creating the print interior and fixing it up and getting it perfect. And yeah. in the end, you know, for how many sales you're getting compared to your digital sales, you really have to ask yourself: Am I better off creating a print version of book one, or am I better off spending that time to write book two and just having having it all digital? For now, which is something I'm I'm kind of thinking about recently, and and I'm I think I'm starting to change my mind on that. I'm starting to think, hmm, maybe I will leave the print versions for one day down the line. You know, when I've got you know the whole series out on digital, and I'm going to do a special release, say like a collector's edition of the whole series in print, maybe something like that. Yeah. Hmm. But it's always, as we say, it's always good to experiment. And uh, if you can do it, you know, try it out. You might uh, be able to get uh, a little bit of uh, more return on investment because, you know, a sale is a sale. Yeah, but, well, uh, fair enough. <laughs> it's, it's always looking at that cost benefit. So, like, if you're living in Canada like me, you can get an ISBN for free, you know, mm. maybe go ahead and do it. And if it doesn't cost that much more, uh, go ahead and do it because, uh, again, kind of the same thing with the print side of things. Uh, putting my second book out uh, definitely increased uh, my overall sales uh, with my books there. Uh, mm. I think I was looking even, it over. Even for I, print? Yeah, for print, yeah. yeah. Uh, cool. I think I was looking it over. I sold uh, maybe two a year before I put out the second book. And mm -hmm. in the past year, uh, I think 2015 from when I put the second book out onward, I think it was about April. Uh, so April to April, I think I sold 33 print oh, books. Wow. Yeah. So that's it's a pretty decent. <laughs> yeah. Pretty decent increase. Yeah. When you put out that second one. So, yeah. Know, well, and if you think about those 33 as, as 33 sales that you wouldn't have had at all, if you didn't bother with the print version, then, well, it becomes very hard for me to say, you know, skip the print version. It'll depend. <laughs> well, yeah, and again, it, it, it all depends on that return on investment, you know, not to get mm. all business-wise, but, you yeah. know, if you if you put $80 extra in per mm. cover uh, to get a print cover, uh, mm. how long is it going to take to get back that 80 extra $80? Yeah. Is it really worth it or is it not? So mm. those, are, those are definitely some questions that you got to, Think for yourself there uh, when you're deciding mm. either to put out the print book or putting on that first one for free. Yeah. You know, that return on investment. It's good to think uh, think business wise when you're when you're going into this. If you do want to kind of turn into a business, as it were. Mm. And even definitely. if not, you know, if you want an extra a little extra money on the side, you know, that's definitely still got to think about that too. So. <laughs> mm. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I think that's uh, that's it for us here today. So thank you for joining us here at Second Drafts Podcast. Please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on everything you need to write, edit, and publish your way. And let us know what you'd like to see from us in a future podcast. See you next time. Yeah, cool. Cheers, guys. Do you want to support production of this YouTube series? Visit www.patreon.com slash and become a patron today.